this week is going to be a very high level overview of an evolving iPad setup. Uh, next week, we can talk about specific apps. Uh, and I hope that some of you guys will actually have some that you're curious enough about to, to, to make requests in advance so I can actually actually prep something. The stuff I'm showing tonight is stuff that I've picked out because it takes unique advantage of the iPad in, in particular ways that, that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, as for substance, I am hoping that this is really going to end up being much more about music than it is about technology and, and a lot more about why to do things and about top level strategies for deciding how to do things uh, rather than getting to, you know, how to in depth and turn this knob three quarters of a revolution to the left and, and, and here's the button over here. That, that, that stuff is kind of uninteresting. Uh, most of what I'll be showing betrays my own musical advice, uh, my own musical biases. I don't do EDM. I don't do modular. Uh, as you all know, I mostly do floaty stuff with bleeps and blurps and wildly inappropriate voiceovers. Uh, and that's what I favor when I pick apps. Uh, or really, when we talk about apps, we're talking about instruments, instruments to work with. Uh, but really, you know, style doesn't matter that much in looking at the iPad because at this point, the, the universe of apps, uh, instruments, effects that are on the iPad would support basically any kind of music that you want to do, uh, including if you want to do modular using my rack, which is basically VCV rack for iPads uh, and with which I have no experience whatsoever. So I'm going to concentrate on how to approach the iPad as a, as a platform uh, and how to approach complexity in general, rather than going deep on specific techniques. Everybody OK so far? You're all muted, so I wouldn't know. Uh, <laughs> So another way to look at this is as, uh, is as Tom's guide to other people's tutorials, uh, because there are any number of very, very good tutorials on practically any iPad app or effect that you can think of out there. If you look in the chat window, uh, you'll see that there's a tutorial collection with a, with a link in there. Uh, they cover everything I'm going to talk about over the next couple of weeks, or at least that I know I'm going to talk about now. Uh, some stuff about tempo synchronization in detail and some stuff about USB. Uh, so for this week, I want to talk about hardware and mechanics, uh, starting with the iPad kind of all by itself, uh, going on to what you get by adding a hosting program, uh, and then talking a little bit uh, to the extent that I can about integration with external devices for, for audio and for MIDI. And unfortunately, we're quite limited in that because I cannot get decent audio video synchronization with, with, the, uh, with the iPad instruments uh, and also use my digital interface. So I'm, I, I've got screenshots to use as, as proxies for that. Uh, next week, again, we'll talk about some, some, uh, some, some swell instruments and, and what they have in common. So at the highest possible level, uh, there are two things about the iPad that, that really stand out. Uh, one is that because of the graphical interface, you know, the touchscreen interface, the iPad really offers instrument designers a, a huge amount of freedom and flexibility that they don't have if they have to design for hardware. It's all software. It's all malleable. Uh, they, 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 they can do what they want, and they can fit uh, what they do to the demands of the instrument in a, in a, in a way that, or the, the, the musical demands of what they're trying to do in a, in a way that's kind of unique and, uh, and really much more satisfying than hardware is in some ways. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a very good thing that they can do that, and I'll, I'll show some examples of that tonight. Sometimes it's not a good thing. There are some stunningly bad interface designs out there. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Igor Vasiliev in particular, the guy who does Soundscaper and Synthscaper and, and, and Fieldscaper, because those, those, those user interfaces are just completely opaque. But a lot of the time, they really do get it right. And they get it a lot righter than they could if they were actually having to build things out of, out of sheet metal and plastic and, and, and so forth and so on. So it's really much, much easier to design an inter interface that makes sense you know, for, for a particular purpose, like a, a drum machine that we'll, we'll see here in a minute. Um, 
but at the same time, there are the the iPad brings some problems with playability because, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, there are no knobs, uh, and that can be a disadvantage. Uh, if you think about sitting there with a rack full of, of of hardware synthesizers, you know all the knobs are available to you. Uh, I mean, increasingly on in some sense, like my Novation Peak, there's a lot of stuff that's buried in menu, menus. But but for basic purposes of playability, it's all right there. You can reach it, you can turn it, you can see it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's not always true with the iPad because you've got one app up on the screen that you're playing and other apps sort of hiding in the background where you have to dive uh, to get at them. And that's before we even get to the problems of something like Loopy that hides most of its functionality behind uh, relatively inaccessible and annoying menus. That was for you, Joe. Uh, so let's think for a moment about the simplest possible setup that you could possibly have, which is actually kind of what I'm using tonight, which is an iPad, a cable, uh, and an amplifier or, or an interface of, of, of some kind. Uh, let me just start something up here. I've got to go turn on my my, my monitor audio so I can hear it, uh, and then I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna show you something. One second. Okay, now I can hear, and I hope you can hear too. Let's let's, uh, let's not do that. Do this and let's share the screen here. Okay, hopefully every everybody is seeing an iPad at this point. Yes, is that true? Good. Okay, that's going to make some noise. This is patterning. It's a drum machine. As you can see, the little thing spins around, and uh, every time it hits the kick drum, you can you can hear it make that noise. Yours is probably lagging a little bit. Everybody hearing that okay? Is what you're seeing making sense? I can only see Carl at the moment, so I'm taking his nods as indication yes, that everybody's well. understanding. Okay, good. Uh, now let's look at something else. If I want to add another sound. It would help if I turned it up in the mixer, I bet. I'm not hearing it yet. How am I living wrong? Now I got something else. Now let's say that I want to do something a little more uh, interesting, like say four against seven. I can back this down to 14 steps. Or if I want to do something five eight-ish, So what you see here is an interface that makes an awful lot of sense for the task that you're tr trying to do, uh, which is to stack you know, polyrhythm up of uh, five against eight, basically. Hey, I'm going to ask a quick question for folks sure. who maybe don't naturally know what that circle represents. Maybe you could cover that a little bit. Sure. Uh, what you're seeing, what each revolution of the circle is, uh, I'm hurting myself here. Each trip around the circle is one bar. And so, as you can see, uh, in this circle, it's divided into what are essentially 16 numbers. We're getting, I'm sorry, into quarter notes. 
so we're essentially getting one beat on each, one, one kick drum kick on each bar line. Now if I go into this other thing, and let's take it back up to 16 again, so it's working in the same division as the other one. Right, you're getting a, you're getting a beat from that little snappy finger thing. Now it's essentially playing quarter now. But if I want to do something like 5-8, I can back this down to 10 division. Take some stuff in and out. Now I have a much more complex rhythm than I could do easily on a hardware sequencer, I think. Uh, I'm waiting for Mike to correct me on that, but I think this is probably a lot easier to do polyrhythms on than it would be if it were a hardware, if it were a hardware and sequencer. And it all depends on how much money you have. <laughs> <laughs> so you're thinking about something like a Circlon or, or, or one of those? No, you could just use another sequencer to, to control the how... Uh, um, the intensity of the notes, like the, you know, each each note I see, the the larger it is, the louder it is, it's like accenting. Yep. Or you could use, um, you could use the skip and uh, um, re um, reset on a sequencer to get time divisions that aren't in fours, uh, uh, aren't in fours, uh -huh. essentially. So you could do five eight on a sequencer if your sequencer has that reset function where you can take the fifth step and say after I'm done playing the fifth step, go back to the beginning. But I bet it isn't as fast as this is. Not even remotely close to as fast as this. Or easy. Uh, this has a lot of other tricks that it does, by the way. Uh, so for example, if I want to change the panning on all of this. Throw half of it into one channel. Half of it into the other. I don't know if you can hear that difference or not. Let me turn it up a little. Is that bouncing nicely back and forth between your ears? Unfortunately, I think Zoom audio is mono. Ah, uh, too bad. Yeah, it sounds audio. It sounds mono. Ah, uh, that's sad. Oh well. I can also control probability, uh, so if I want to, I can make some of these less likely to happen than others. Uh, the newer That's version of pattern, yeah. You can also do filter cutoffs, velocity, tuning, uh, attacks. You've got uh, filtering capability here. Sure that's here. Uh, lots of different tricks you can do. All of it, again, pretty intuitive and pretty well separated into, into layers. Anybody want to explore anything else on this, or can I go on with this simple version to, to something else? I assume this has MIDI sync, right? Yeah, I see MIDI learn at the top, so it must. Yep. Uh, yeah, you go on. We'll talk about sync in a minute, but what I'm find, finding most useful, the short take on it, is that most of the iPad apps now support Ableton Link. Uh, and it's much easier just to sync everything internally to the iPad using Link and then do something to pull in any external MIDI instruments that you, that you may want. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways you can do that. My interface does it, for, for example. All right, let's look at something else. Oh, stop it. Go away. Never fails. Doesn't it, 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 isn't that just, oh, stop it. Good lord. All right, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, okay. Let's add a little articulation. <laughs> an example of a really complex interface. But an interesting one. Hey Tom, can you back the, the uh, volume of that uh, down a little bit as compared to your voice? 
Yes, I can. How's that better? Yeah, Sounds the overall great. volume. Right. Well, theoretically, I've got a bus master here. Oh, I think, yeah, I think there might be a lag. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. How's that? That's good. That's good. And you can see I've got some kind of novel controls here. Like, turn this little dice thing around in the upper right corner. It screws with the whole mod maker. In ways that are intensely unpre un unpredictable. Let that go for a minute. Maybe play a little bit of a lead. Now what you can't see, because my fingers are not visible in the screen, is that as I move my finger up and down on each of these keys, I get more or less Maybe you can see it if I show you the actual Xbox. Okay, so far? Yeah, I think one of the things worth mentioning about an instrument like the Animo that you were playing there a moment ago is that you can you can set what scale it plays so you can never hit a wrong note, which is, you know, if you're not a musician, that helps out a lot. Well, listen, one point I want to make is that my entire musical career consists of using technology to replace motor skill, and <laughs> it's a pretty good example. So you can see, I'm set up for CA only in here. All right, let's look at another. Let's add another one. Okay, now nobody asked me what the hell these screens mean because they're impossible to figure out, but they make good noises. Also cheating a little bit because I've got a decaying looper set up on this, as you can hear.
Okay, so let me jump out of that screen share for a minute. So there's a couple of points I want to make about that. Uh, first of all, all of those interfaces are novel and very, very, very different. Uh, and certainly things you could not do uh, in hardware, or at least not easily. Uh, secondly, oh man, I've got to turn this, I got to turn this monitor off because I'm, I'm driving myself crazy. So a couple of things to point out about that. I mean, one is obviously that those interfaces are all radically, radically different from one another. Uh, the other is that even though you, you, you saw me using uh, a hosting program on um, in the background what i what i was trying to show you really was just what a pain in the neck it is to switch back and forth between apps uh when you're actually trying to do something musical on stage uh, the first time that i i did a, a show at neem uh back in in 16 i did a set there and i didn't know a thing about hosting programs i had three or four apps running on two different ipads and it was this incredible exercise in practicing followed by fumble fingers, uh, not just because of the problems of switching between apps, but because no two apps put controls in the same place. Uh, and it's terribly confusing as, as, as a performer to have to jump back and forth between all of that, particularly because if, if, if you stop and think about it for a minute, um, an awful lot of what we do as performers uh, with any kind of uh, electro music is, first of all, it's multi-instrumental for the most part, for, for, for most of it, uh, for most of us. And, and second of all, it, it takes on this aspect of live mixing a lot of the time. Uh, and you're not always right about your, your, your first impulses in, in, in how you've got the thing set up. And it's necessary to kind of continuously adjust as you're playing. Uh, piano players do that with foot pedals, uh, but but if you're if you're if you're working with something like an iPad, you don't want to have to go diving back and forth between uh, between apps to do it. There really is this kind of kind of fumble finger problem. Uh, so you know, and that's a nice thing about knobs. They make that kind of the, they they make that kind of live mixing easy because they're all right there. You can reach them. Instrument designers increasingly are making the most used performer knobs more prominent, like bigger. Uh, so, for example, on the Novation Peak, the the filter cutoff knob is is twice the size of any of the others because they know that that's the one that everybody's everybody's going to reach for. Uh, so, you know, in short, left to itself, the iPad uh, makes live mixing really kind of hard to do. There's a lot of screen fumbling. Uh, no two instruments have the same controls in the same place. So just trying to use their volume controls is, is, is confusing. Uh, and you can get into a certain amount of menu and mode diving. I don't, I don't know if you noticed this particularly or not, but there is no visible volume control anywhere in TC11. That's that thing that has the sort of multiple radar screens there. In, in, in different colors. Uh, and you, you, you cannot, in fact, get to a volume adjustment on it without diving way down uh, into, into, its, into its menu structure because that's all pre-programmed and it's meant to be, and it's meant to be touch controlled. Uh, incidentally, there was not one ounce of MPE used in any of that. Uh, that was all the native iPad interface without, without MPE control of, of, of any kind. Um, it's, it's just how it, it's just how the touch screen works. So the next step then is to try to come up with something that allows you to do a, a, a little live mixing. And that's when we get into something like Alm or AUM as, as some people call it. It's a, it's a product from Chimatica. Let me, let me, uh, let me show you the screen again. Okay, now do I have to tell it that I want to share audio at this point? Again, no, it's smart enough to know that I want to do that. So this is your basic, this is your basic OM um, screen. You can see a bunch of stuff there and the starting in the upper left-hand corner. Um, is my mouse visible to you or is it only visible to me? It is visible to you. So Starting in the upper, upper left-hand corner, you can see that we're using Ableton Link and that it's going at a tempo of 100, which is left over from something I did with Carl last week. Uh, you've got transport controls here. You've got, you've got a, a VU meter of, of sorts, a uh, couple of mysterious squiggles here that we'll get to in a minute. And then what looks very much like uh, 
a four channel mixer with a master, right? With, a, with instruments ranged across the top, Animoog, I click on that and uh, presumably I see it. And presumably I can then get rid of it. Go back home. Uh, factory uh, patterning and TC11, and then the, the, they're all sending to the same. They're all sending to the same bus over here. So I have what amounts to a master. I have what amounts to a master volume control for the whole thing. And in fact, when Mike asked me to quiet it down, uh, that was what I used. In each of these, uh, following signal flow the way it would in a physical mixer, you've got the ability to stick in uh, effects of various sorts. Uh, this one is Cosmonaut, uh, which is a kind of delaying looper effect thing that I use quite a bit, uh, mostly to, in a, in a manner of speaking, play with myself. Uh, and as you, you know, as you hit each one of these, they, they come up so you can, you, you can monkey with them. Uh, but basically as a mixing interface, this is just, you know, completely right there for you to mix stuff as you need to. And you can switch back and forth between apps. Uh, it will host basically any app that supports either inter-app audio or audio unit version three, uh, which are the two standards for making hostable plugins uh, in, in, in iOS. It will work with either one. Most people, I think, prefer audio unit stuff for a couple of reasons that we'll, we'll get to a, a bit later on. Um, and again, you can, it, again, it's just like a mixer. At, at, at the bottom, it's feeding into a, into a bus for, for which there is a, uh, for which there is a, the, across here, for which there is a master uh, hereabouts. And uh, there are various means. I, I have complete control over the ordering and labeling and everything else regarding regarding these channels. Uh, it does come with a bunch of its own effects. If I want to add, uh, if I want to add one, let's, let's do one here on factory. Uh, there's stereo processing stuff I can do, filters and EQs, dynamics, uh, bus sends, hardware sends, et cetera, et cetera. All that, all that comes with it. If I hit one of these, it will show me all of the various audio unit apps I have available to me to throw in there. It's basically just a, a roster of effects. Uh, similarly for everything with inter-app audio. We can talk a little bit about the merits of uh, AU versus IAA in a minute. Um, it has stereo processing stuff that comes with it. Uh, it has filter and EQ stuff that comes with it. It has dynamics control that comes with it. Um, not a decent compressor, by the way, uh, but you can find those certainly. And then routing stuff for bus, bus effects and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and you can just continue to stack these in the order of signal flow. So if I wanted, let, let, I don't know, I'm just gonna throw random shit in here. Um, I can throw that, I can throw in sound fruits, which takes a second to load. If I want to pull up, I can add one and toss in, oh, I don't know, some random reverb, et cetera, et cetera. And then each of those pops up with its own control surface. Uh, let's stop there for a second in case anybody has questions. Anybody? If anybody's talking, I can't hear you and it's probably my fault. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, so no, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Well, this is an unusually passive group. <laughs> How about uh, talking about that DSP meter a little bit? Uh, yeah, okay, I can do that. It's, it's, it's up here. Uh, the DSP meter is telling you basically how much of the DSP's capacity is being used at the moment. And in fact, if you start up a bunch of complicated stuff, let me, let me do that. Um, yeah, okay, so factory is playing and Uh, 
Yeah, I was going to try to force it high, but I haven't really got anything that will do that. It, it, it's showing you basically how much of the digital sound processor is being used. And if that number gets up above, let's say, 85% or so, you're going to start having uh, very, very interesting problems with lag and the thing otherwise going to hell in any number of different and entertaining ways, which seem to vary <laughs> depending on what's causing the load. Uh, so you do want to kind of keep your eye on that, because uh, it really is possible uh, with something like OM um, to go crazy and put 16 channels of stuff in there, all of which is eating DSP and all of which is eating CPU, and you, you, you suddenly end up with this horrid mess, or, or worse yet, with the whole thing locking up altogether. So you do have to kind of keep an eye on it. Uh, this is Jim. There's, um, I don't know if maybe a lot of people are just familiar with OM, um, and that's why they're not saying much. Um, but a couple of things that um, I write that if you're not real familiar with it, uh, Tom, would be that you can change the order of those effects. You can change your signal chain, show how when you slide to the side, that sort of temporarily disable it, right? Yep. Uh, or eject it remove it by clicking that little thing instead of sliding it back. Yep. And that there, that's also where by clicking on that, you can also um, assign it to pre-fader or post-fader. Yep. Yep. I don't normally get into well, those I don't kinds know how of deep you want to go with this. Well, I'll tell you, I'm, 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 I'm happy to go as deep as anybody wants to, but I will point out that Unusually for an iPad app, OMS documentation is extremely good. Uh, and there's a link to it on that tutorial page that's linked from the chat. And honestly, spending the, uh, I, I think it'd probably take you half an hour to 45 minutes to read it in, in, in its entirety. And it really does cover everything and cover it very, very clearly. Uh, there, the Chimatica's uh, technical writing is unusually good. Uh, for music software, <laughs> and uh, and it really is. It's it's a very good reference. There's also a very good Gavinsky uh, tutorial for it out there uh, that will show you basically anything and and, and everything that you want to know. Um, I'm not smart enough to do fancy signal chain stuff, so I typically don't. Uh, and I find myself going back to the manual again and again whenever I want to do something uh, halfway complicated. You can also have, by the way, channels that are devoted exclusively to MIDI controllers, uh, like this one here on the right. Is I actually had that running some external synths at one point, but I'm not going to be able to show that tonight because reasons. <laughs> uh, it was just a little too much routing trouble for my, uh, for my pad. Uh, so let's see what else guys uh now that we're now that we're staring at all tom i have a question it's ken sure uh, i presume you can save this as a preset yes uh not only can you save it as a preset this gets us into one of the major advantages of the auv3 plugins as opposed to everything else if you save your a if you save your uh effects presets as auv3 as you can see, I've done here with, 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 with some stuff. It will not only restore, oh, stop it. Uh, it will not only restore your settings uh, for the stuff that is obviously OM, like the channels and, 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 and apps and, and, and routing and all of that, it will save all of the settings in the effect as well. So you can completely reconstitute your, 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 your setup from a saved preset if you're using AUV3 plugins. That makes sense? Yeah, that's pretty cool. It is, it is, it is kind of great, actually. That's my big argument with Animog. <laughs> yeah. It's not being AUV3. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're all catching up slowly, but, uh, yeah. but yes, it's, it's, it's annoying to say the least. Um, what uh, you get is you still get the you still get the uh, the device the instrument there, but it's default settings or maybe whatever you've used since then or whatever. So yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Tom, um, oops, I might be muted. No, you're good. Oh, okay. Um, 
w one thing I get like um, to use um for, and I don't know if you do, and maybe you can demonstrate it, is to use one of the apps controlling all the other apps. Hmm. Okay, we can do that. Uh, let's see. What's the best way to do that? Let's try a MIDI thing in the form of Collider. And this is going to cause me to dive into the ever annoying ah, routing interface. <laughs> that was my question. How do I do routing? <laughs> is that your yeah, question? There you go. Problem. Suppose you want to route and you want to sync with an external instrument. Do you sync it to AUM or the apps inside of AUM? Ah, uh, well, okay. This is going to take us. This is going to take us down a considerable rabbit hole, but it's one I was going to go down anyway. Um, let me back up a step from the actual question and talk about a couple other things first. Uh, if you look at, let me, let me just uh, switch things here a second. I don't want that. I want, what do I want? I want this. This is what, this is what that routing, whoops, stop that. <laughs> this is what that routing matrix looks like when I actually have my full interface hooked up there. Uh, and as Johnny knows to his pain, the iConnect also offers routing capabilities within the unit itself. So one of the things that you need to be very, very clear in your mind about when you do these things uh, is at which layer of the whole setup you are going to do what. And you need to make consistent decisions about that or you are going to create enormous confusion for yourself. Uh, I, at the moment, have a sort of a mixed setup that is driving me crazy. That's one thing I learned in the process of preparing for this talk. Uh, and I need to undo a bunch of it and make sure that all of the routing stuff is really strictly being done in AUM. Uh, because I've got a million other things impinging on that, including stuff that's set up in the firmware and the interface, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So bottom line, before you do anything that involves routing, decide at what layer of the process you're going to do it. And I actually think that OM um, is probably the, the, the most flexible. Now, to get to the very specific question about synchronization, um, if you're using a, the question is, what do I need to sync? If I'm using something like an arpeggiator or a controller like Otney, which is just a thing that generates uh, quasi random MIDI sequences. Uh, I don't need to actually send MIDI clock to the instrument that that thing, that sequencer basically is controlling. I need to send clock to the sequencer. So much of the time, if you're just using, uh, if you're using a sequencer that is iPad based, all you need to do is ensure that it is getting Ableton link or is, is, is otherwise getting tempo information from somewhere. And it will take care of the problem of driving the instrument at the actual tempo that, that you want. Uh, if, on the other hand, what you want to do is ensure that the instrument is getting clock so that it will be synced when you play it, say if you're using an arch internal arpeggiator built into that instrument, then what you need to do is find a way to get MIDI clock to that external instrument itself. Uh, and that is typically done, uh, the way I do it is to use an app. Let me see if I can, can put it up here for you. Let's go back to, let's go back to, um, what do I want to do? I want to look at the iPad. Okay. Yeah, here it is. So this is an app called MIDI Link Sync. Uh,
as you can see, it's taking clock from Ableton Link at 100 BPM. I don't have any MIDI destination selected for it at the moment, but if I wanted to, if I actually had my interface hooked up, I would be seeing all of the potential MIDI destinations within the interface lined up in this list down here, and I could simply pick out one of them, um, say, like network session one, and say, okay, start the clock, and as you'll see, with a little bit of hunting around, it's actually syncing the MIDI clock going out to the Ableton link clock that it's getting in. Notice that I have link to MIDI set, uh, selected up here. So at this point, this thing is sending a, a closely synchronized, although as you can see, not completely synchronized MIDI, uh, MIDI clock to whatever, that, to whatever that destination is on, on that instrument. Is that making sense? Not sure. Okay. <laughs> um, say if your master clock is an external instrument, such as the deluge, and you've got a bunch of instruments that are being controlled, and one of them is is an iPad app. Uh huh. And you want to get the iPad app in sync, just like you've got all your hardware instruments in sync. Well, what I would do in a situation like that, and I'm not, uh, I don't know the deluge well enough to know how you would get a clock signal to the iPad. Presumably you could route it through an, an, an iPad interface of some kind, but at that point you could, if you wanted to synchronize in the opposite direction, this will also synchronize as you can see from where my, my mouse pointer is, is waving around up there. You can also take MIDI and, and, and turn it into Ableton Link uh, if, if you want. Uh, so if I were starting, if my master clock were on a hardware instrument, I would I would run that clock through an interface to the iPad, and I would take the, I would take the MIDI clock and, and sync sync Ableton to it. So, so the question the, the question boils down to: Are you going to drive MIDI uh, using Ableton Link, or are you going to drive Ableton Link using MIDI? Uh, and clearly, what you want to do is 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 take a take a MIDI clock signal and, 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 and somehow translate it into link and, and this will do it for you. So, so hey, you hey, Laura, you let, me, let me throw some information out there because what you just described, I have done dozens and dozens of times. So my recommendation is anytime you're using a computer to do music, there's, under, there's an underlying thing that occurs. There's many underlying things concerned, but one of them is CPU wait states. You will never ever get perfect clock out of any kind of computer. There will always be jitter like you're seeing right there because the CPU has to stop and do other things in the background and then pick up the task of making sure that sync, sync stays in sync. This is a problem that is a lot less likely with dedicated hardware because the process this is that it is doing, if it is a digital piece of equipment, are, it's dedicated to that. It's a computer that's built specifically for that task. So I would always use external clock in that case. So in your case, I would use the deluge as the clock. Right. And since clock doesn't care about MIDI, MIDI channel, you would just, you know, and I, what I would do, your mileage may vary, but I would, my inter, I would connect that device to whatever interface I was using to get MIDI into the iPad and then convert MIDI into link. Uh, that, that's pretty much... Um, there was a time when I was trying to go with the iPad as a substitute for Ableton, and I ran into this problem, and like you said, I just said I'd be better off moving it and using hardware. Um, so that's what I've been doing. Um, but if I want to use one of the iPad apps, like the Arpeggiator or whatever, I forget what it's called. Um, the problem is how you how you are going to set up your, the little grid. I don't know if I could show it to you, but it's the, um, it's the grid in, um, in AUM and it's got this complicated, um, you know, AUM destination, blah, blah, blah. And I just wasn't sure. Um, I could also go into the app itself and some of the apps would accept external MIDI clock and some of them wouldn't and you know yeah that's it so some of there was one app that I that I used to use called cauldron 
And um, that was pretty good about, you could set it up to accept um, external clock and it would do fine. Um, I think there was a whole lot of them that just were, were written, not written well enough to be able to accept external lady clock. Yeah, there's a lot of variation. Uh, I, I think over time it has mostly improved to take external clock. I mean, my my biggest resentment in life is that nobody has ever fixed the the the, the MIDI support in Thor, uh, which is an app that I an iPad app that I actually like a lot for pads, but I can't perform live with it anymore because it's just the MIDI is completely unreliable. Exactly. It's 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 kind of like I just kind of concluded that the iPad was like the wild west. Everybody had it, their own rules and it was, you know, real frustrating. Yeah, that, that, that's what happens when you have a lot of app developers jumping in the pool. I will say that because of programs like OM um, being available, uh, there is an awful lot more standardization and an awful lot more uniformity than there, than, than there used to be and a lot better support and and pretty good information to be found online about how all of this stuff works for for, for each particular app so there, there there's a fair amount of support out there at the same time uh there is still stuff that is going to be non-standardized because you know developers do what developers do and they all have idiosyncrasies and they all have things they they, they believe in and they don't believe in um, the other thing too is that uh and, and, and maybe this is my excuse to go on and, and, and talk a little bit about using digital inputs and outputs uh, via, via some kind of interface. Uh, unfortunately, a, a disadvantage of my setup here is that I'm not really going to be able to show you a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. But, but let, me, let me start in for a second. Uh, this is actually the interface I use. It's an iConnect MIDI 4 Plus. It handles both audio and MIDI signals. Uh, you can see this, this is the front panel. Uh, it has two USB host type ports, uh, each of which will take an iPad. Uh, it has a standard five pin MIDI uh, in and out on the front. If you look at the back, uh, you get more MIDI ports. You get an ethernet connection. Uh, you get a USB connector that, 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 that can, also, uh, can also carry uh, can also carry USB MIDI. I actually use that with uh, with an OP1 and then a, a, a connector to the host host computer, whatever that is. Uh, so basically, you get four MIDI in and out. You can chain those, of course, uh, if if you want, and you get unbelievably ridiculously complicated routing interfaces like the one I'm I'm showing you now. <laughs> um, I have done shows uh, where all the routing was done internal to the iConnect. I, I did one at, uh, at, at Mountain Skies because for some reason I convinced myself that I didn't want to take a laptop along. I did all the routing inside the, the, the iConnect. I don't recommend that. Uh, I really think keeping the iConnect configuration as simple as possible and then using something that's a lot more transparent like the uh, like the OM matrix is really is, is, is really a better way to go. And I need to start moving my own practices so that I'm really doing everything there. It's just too confusing. Uh, as, as, as I say, Johnny has found this out to his pain. The iConnect uh, configuration software, the old stuff was just, uh, it was just horrible. The new stuff is better, but while it keeps simple stuff simple, it makes complex stuff harder. I, I would much, much prefer to do that in software here, particularly with something that is as straightforward as this is. I mean, you can see what it does. You've got the output of Otney's, Otney's MIDI output going to whatever is plugged into the iConnect MIDI 4, uh, ETH 4, although which in this case happens to be a bunch of hardware synthesizers. And I've also got Rosetta Collider going to that same place. It's a very straightforward, whoops, stop that, Tom. It's a very straightforward routing grid. Uh, um, uh, are you going to ever, is there ever going to be a part of this workshop where you are going to explain exactly what's going on because you've got the iConnect over on the vertical side and then you've got basically the same stuff over on the horizontal side. So the iConnect is, is connected to what is that connected to some hardware and yep. the hardware is the um, is the clock is that correct 
Uh, hang on. So basically what I have in this, in this setup, uh, I have an iPad that is connected via a standard iPad lightning connection cable to one of these two ports in the front. Uh, and that shows up in this grid in one of these locations at the top. These are essentially everything across the top line here, the horizontal uh, axis, so to speak, is a MIDI source. Everything going down the right-hand side is a MIDI destination. Okay. And things show up in the same place because it, uh, the things show up in both places because uh, they can actually function as as, as either. Uh, let me use uh, Laura's confusion on this point to make a much much larger point about working with audio interfaces in general and MIDI and audio interfaces in particular. Uh, interfaces are confusing as hell. And it's worth taking a minute to sort of get into the weeds a little bit with them. And the first thing I would say, particularly in response to Laura's question is, no matter how simple you think your setup is, when you get a new interface, it really pays to take the time to sort of make a map uh, and figure out exactly what corresponds to what, because there can be, you, you can encounter on all of these things like three or four different sets of labels that you have to contend with. So let's, let's just talk about, about audio for a moment. I mean, there are going to be physical labels on the X outside of the gear identifying what each of those things is. You know, this is MIDI one, this is, this is USB one, USB two, maybe. Uh, on the back, we have some other things that are not particularly clearly labeled. I mean, what the hell is that? Uh, there's a MIDI two, three, and four here. There's this thing that's a USB connector that's not actually labeled with a USB number in the same way that these are. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got the physical labeling on the device. You've got the labeling that is used in whatever kind of configuration software or other internal mixer. I mean, in, in the case of the iConnect, it's, it's an internal routing interface. In the case of something like a, a Scarlet interface, it would be a bunch of audio channels. They're labeled in some way or other that may or may not correspond to the labels on the outside of the device itself. Uh, there may be some kind of internal, in the case of an audio interface, there may be some kind of internal mixer that has another set of labels. And finally, the set of labels that you actually see in the host computer uh, may or may not look anything like the labels on the outside of the box or the labels on the mixer or the labels on the internal configuration stuff. So I have always found it enormously useful when I get a new device of this kind to sit down, take a piece of spreadsheet software and, and, and just make a map, list the physical inputs down, down, down one side and then what they correspond to in the internal routing stuff and then what they correspond to in terms of any mixer software that's in there and what they correspond to when I see it inside whatever is hosting the thing. Uh, does that make sense? Be, be, because honestly, this is where most people's frustration comes from is just the fact that all of this stuff, that the, the same thing is labeled differently depending on which layer of the setup you're actually looking at. Uh, and like I say, half an hour spent with a spreadsheet figuring out what corresponds to what is going to save you an enormous, enormous amount of time down the road. Well, if I may, uh, Tom, it would help if something like I can say your Oracle uh, would give us that, you know. Yeah. Doesn't. yeah. They don't. And unfortunately, there's a lot that they can't know. Uh, for example, if I plug in an audio interface to an OS X uh, machine, any, any, any sort of Mac, you know, and I then look at how the, those inputs are identified in something like Jamkazam, they've all got very generic numbers. It's like, you know, input one. Okay, well, what the fuck is that <laughs> actually when it's, when it's in the audio interface? And, you know, 
I, I have found myself taking like a cable tester or some other kind of signal generator or sometimes just, you know, patterning playing percussion uh, to figure out where the damn signal is going. And, and, and as I say, a half an hour spent making that kind of map in advance is going to save you an enormous amount of, of pain down the road. And it's, it's a pain in the ass and it's tedious uh, and, it's, and, it, and it's not fun to do. Uh, but it's a lot more fun than wondering where the hell the signal went. <laughs> this is a particularly complex example, I, I think, too, because there are so many inputs and outputs on the on that I connect. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely everybody's nightmare, <laughs> and the more so because I connect is not too careful about how they label stuff. Actually, Motu is worse. Mm. Uh, Motu is worse. I, I, I have a Motu uh, Microbook 2C that I love for the latency, but that has just caused me an awful lot of heartache <laughs> trying to figure out what in its internal software mixer corresponds to what and how the hell you turn the direct monitoring off. But, but anyway, I mean, that's just, that's, that's just a word to the wise. I mean, I really would spend a bunch of time making sure that I understood how stuff in and on and around uh, the interface is labeled uh, and how it shows up in something like this routing table and, and, and so forth and so on. And if you have to, you know, just test it. I, I can't show you this uh, because I'm just using a static screenshot here, but actually in the case of ALM's routing interface, when something is sending MIDI as a, a, MIDI, as a MIDI source, You'll actually see it light up. Actually, the, the, the USB two is 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 lit up here, uh, as, as you can see, and it'll actually pulse to show you that there's MIDI incoming on whatever on whatever that source is, and that is very helpful. Uh, well, you do have it's not an external source, but you do have on your uh, uh, own session that you've got up to your live one. You do have a couple of those MIDI. Uh, instruments, the uh, collider, and yes, at least show when you do the routing what it looks like. So if you routed, you know, uh, factory to uh, collider on on your live session, not on this. Oh, I see. Yeah, still. Yep, I could do that. And the thing too that I'm thinking is where every is different here where he was showing you on the live session how you can uh, label your uh, your channel strips and you have a lot of control on that MIDI matrix you can't you don't have any control over how those items are are labeled right? uh, no you don't really they, they just they come in and you gotta like, recognize that's what that is that's what that is and on the apps, it's quite good because they've got the icons and the name. Yeah, maybe whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, in, in homage to, to, to Mike, this is a much simpler setup. As you can see, the uh, as you can see, the collider is actually doing something at the moment. It's routed to a piece of hardware that is no longer there on on, on the iConnect. Uh, if I wanted to send it to Animog, I could uh, just by. Whoops, missed. There we go. And if I actually had Animog set up to receive it uh, with the proper channel and all of that, it would it would it would do a thing. Uh, you know, and the, 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 again, this interface is actually quite easy to use. I can send Otney to uh, to factory, for example, or or whatever. But uh, you're right; you have no control over this labeling. You have to sort of have to sort of know what it is. But it's 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 not that difficult. Hi, uh, this is Frank. I have a question because <clears throat> I've just started to consider playing my iPad from external MIDI controllers. So uh -huh. I, assume, I assume that if you have an external MIDI controller that this is going to be your, uh, your reference map and that uh, just by setting it to the appropriate channel, you can point your external MIDI controller to any of these AU units or Sure. Let's pretend that this keyboard here is really uh, 
is really an external controller. It's not. It's a bit. It's a built-in keyboard. But let's let's pretend for a moment that it's it's an external controller like you have. If I want to send that to a factory, let me just undo a bunch of this stuff. If I want to send that keyboard to factory, I would do that here. Uh, I would need to make sure that factory was set up to look at the proper at, at whatever MIDI channel that keyboard was sending. Obviously, I mean, if the keyboard is sending channel would, nine, factory needs you to look at this, channel nine. In this case, then could you do layering, or could you just do it so that uh, uh, you don't hear animo, but it's controlling another unit? Sure, uh, you can do any kind oh. of routing you want to. If you want to send a keyboard to multiple instruments, you can certainly do that. Uh, in fact, I, I, I had something that I intended to demo that was set up that way that, that needs the bigger rig. Uh, and you can do all manner of sort of splits and mangling and, and so forth and so on. And there are even, uh, there are even uh, MIDI manglers that run on the iPad that will reroute uh, or, or essentially transform, uh, transform so MIDI stuff in software. If you wanted to do range editing and mangling like that, does AUM have any MIDI devices that do that, or do you have to use some external application? You'd have to use an external app of some kind. Uh, oh. Offhand, I don't, I, I don't do much of that. So offhand, I really don't know what to suggest, but I, I, I strongly suspect there's stuff out there that does it. Uh, on the rare occasions when I do something like that, I tend to do that on, on a laptop that handles most of my routing on the on, on the big road rig. So I'm I'm not I'm not familiar with it at all, but I'm 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 quite sure there is something out there that will do that for you. In fact, I've seen setups that that actually are made to put in set lists for people who are doing long, complicated shows. And now we're talking like like touring professional musicians uh, in which you can pre-program splits and all of that stuff that you're talking about and put it into a set list. Uh, so that you can switch it from song to song. So I imagine there might be some devices that you can put in the AUM as insert devices, the way uh, Ableton has MIDI MIDI effects. Yeah, I'm I'm not an Ableton guy, so that's not a, that's not a useful that's that's not a useful comparison for me. But yes, I'm sure you can do that. I, I can contest to what he's saying, and if such an app exists that supports the protocols that are required to work with OM, yes. It would be it, that exact analog. Cool beans. All right, I I um, forget. Can, you can map AUM itself to a controller. So if you have your different channels in AUM, you can control them with something like the launch control. So you could map you can map AUM to that. Uh, and, and control your volumes just like a mixer. Yes, yes, you can. Uh, in fact, I use uh, I, again something unfortunately that I can't demonstrate tonight. There is a there's an analog to uh, there's a program comparable to my friend TC11 here called TC Data oh. that you can actually use to send. Uh, CC data and 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 uh, and anything else you can think of uh, out to an external synthesizer. I use it a lot with a chord radius. Ooh. Uh, and it's it's well, uh, it's kind of MPE without the MPE. It takes a little bit of care and craziness to set up. Let me let me just see if I can pull it up on the on the screen here out of out of nowhere. Uh, where do I keep these things? I just search. I, I, it's to a point now on my iPad where I use the search function. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, so so this is this is TC data in the way that I would use it with uh, with with the radius. And basically, I've got a controller for pitch over here that is 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 set. It's, it's preset to a scale, which you can which you can actually do in in TC11. So I tell it, okay. 
um, I would like you to be. Well, that's beautiful. I'd like you to be C minor. Uh, this is controlling actually two filters, one on the x-axis, one on the y-axis. And this is controlling the mixer on the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on the radius. Uh, the radius is a, it has four, four timbers uh, that, that it mixes. And this will, this will change that mix. That's all stuff that I set up because I thought that was what would uh, yield the most in terms of playability. Is the radius the, the core <laughs> hardware synth or is the radius something else? Yeah, it's the core hardware synth. Oh, okay. That would be wonderful with your Waldorf, I bet. So you can see how it's been set up here, basically. So one is controlling note. Uh, one is sending a modulation CC, and this is some, I, 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 I honestly have no memory of how the hell I set this up. <laughs> but, uh, but that's essentially what it does. And, and uh, you know, you, you could do that in, in any number of ways, depending on what makes your hardware instrument the most playable. Uh, for me, I, I like to have controls over the filter and the mixture of the voices and over pitch. Okay, so far? Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, let me see what else I wanted to say about this. Um, yeah, I mean, just to just to go back to this problem of map making again, it's and I, and I think we probably touched on this a little bit, but just to underscore the uh, just to underscore the point, you can get uh, software based MIDI monitors for basically any any device, but 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 particularly within the iPad, there are things that will 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 tell you where MIDI is going and what it's seeing and so forth and so on. Uh, I also suggest. Uh, because it saved me a huge amount of trouble over the years, just picking up a a simple signal generator. I just I just use some twenty dollar uh, Behringer cable tester for that purpose. And and frankly, when I showed up for my first neem, I was quite surprised that I was the only person on the premises who seemed to have one. Because <laughs> you know, cable checking. Of course, you do that. Uh, but it's a really handy thing to have when you're doing that kind of doing that kind of mapping. I, I use a voltmeter. I guess I'm old school. Yeah, you are. <laughs> That's really old school. Um, what else? I think that's I I I think that's about it. That's what I that's that's what I came prepared to talk about and we're 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 getting toward the end of the hour, but 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 let's have more questions. Uh, Tom, this is this is Russ. Hi Russ. Um, just just a real quick question. What model of iPad do you have? Because I, I have an older one, and I'm not sure it would necessarily run all of this stuff. I have a fairly, I, honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look. Uh, it's an iPad Pro. It's not a, it's not a very, oh, stop that. It's not a particularly new one. Do we have an about this thing here somewhere? Yep. We do. Where are you about this thing? Hello. Go back to general. Go back to general. Uh -huh. On the left-hand menu. What? Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's at the top on the right. There it is. There you go. Okay. So it's a 12.9-inch iPad Pro. Uh... Somebody's cautious about updating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Very cautious. Yeah, I think it's a iPad, the first generation big big iPad Pro. I think you and I have the same iPad. Yeah, yeah I, think I, so. I haven't run into any issue. No, uh, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to the M1s. I have to say, although at the moment I think it's probably it, it's probably not time yet. What do you have, Russ? Uh, it, it, 
Well, I'm, I'm still on iOS 11, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm even yeah. more cautious about the update. Uh, I don't know, it just says iPad on it, and it's a model MGTX2LL slash A. Hmm. Yeah. But it's not, it's not like ancient, because I do have an ancient one that was like, you know, they're sort of like really thick ones. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's probably a lot of apps that are still out there if you if they're still available in the app store for one that is at ios 11 which isn't too terribly old yeah and, and i can update the, the the only reason i haven't done the ios i did that live the, the the you know the update is i did that live performance back in december and like the one thing i use this for uh is for switching presets on my continuum because it's a lot easier to like have you know the name of them than to like just like press on like you know the, the surface and like you know well i think that was the right one um and like i absolutely did not want to break that prior to that and then i've just been busy since then so i haven't updated it so maybe, maybe i'll see like how far up it goes and then i can see what uh see where see where we get with with uh you know maybe a run alm and some of these other things uh actually the, you, you just reminded me that there was one other thing i wanted to show you guys tonight um you can, OMB supports MIDI Learn for basically any parameter that it exposes, which is volume control, muting, uh, soloing, record enable. And for any, whoops, stop that. And for any parameters that the, uh, uh, that, the, that the app exposes, actually I should just go back to the regular screen share because I can actually show you that here. So if we open up, let's say the one for factory Oops. i can do midi learn for the basic channel controls for uh, for the channel itself volume muting solo record enable but i also uh, factory exposes a huge number of parameters that I can also control externally with, with, with a MIDI controller. I mean, look at that. There's just a, a, a ridiculous ton of stuff in there that you can get at from the outside. And my chosen device for this is uh, a MIDI fighter twister. It's something that Charles Schreiner actually recommended to me. It's got 16 knobs in four banks. Uh, each knob is continuous. It also has a push function uh, with the use of a MIDI mangler, you can also do a push and turn thing with it uh, that, that gets you, it, it essentially doubles the number of things that, that, that you can control. Uh, it also has three buttons down the side uh, on each side that you can use for various purposes, but honestly, the only ones I use are the middle one on each side to advance a bank and, and go back a bank. You can do all sorts of complicated programming of the colors on this thing to change color when you do stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's really nice. It's a really nice external controller. And it allows, uh, you, you, you guys have seen me using it in sets. It, 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 per, it permits a huge amount of live mixing and a lot, a lot of control over, over many, many things in, in um because as I say, you can actually get at all this stuff uh, with the AUV3 with the AUV3 apps. Uh, you know, if we look at Animo, uh, with that in mind, it's going to be uh, a lot less helpful in what it makes available with, with it. You know, I can either bypass it or I can bring the app up, and that's about it. Uh, Cosmonaut, on the other hand, exposes a lot of stuff. So another another nice argument in favor of, of of AUV3. I really like the Twister a lot. It has been it's it's remarkably easy to program, uh, and it has been uh, just just a godsend in terms of live performance. Tom, are you set up to um, uh, talk about how you can uh, sync two iPads together? Through Ableton using missing link. 
I'm not. I'm, I'm not really. I'm not really set up to. I'm not really set up to show that. Um, what Jim is. What Jim is talking about. I mean, I suppose that if I, I put my mind to it and and pulled up a browser here, I could show you. Uh, let's just see. Next week. Yeah, we could do that. Um, let me just let me just pull up a picture of this little beast if I can. This thing. Oops, upside down. Uh, let's see. All right, let me uh, let me redo my my sharing thing. Actually, you know what I could do is just take this little devil and shift it over here. You seeing that now? Are you seeing a little box with glowing numbers on it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so what this is is a little device made by a company called Circuit Happy called uh, the Missing Link. Uh, what it does is it puts out Ableton Link uh, Ableton Link information onto whatever wireless network you choose to connect it to, and you 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 set tempo with it, uh, either using the knob or using the tap tempo feature. Uh, but it also puts out uh, it also puts out CV gate and it also puts out USB MIDI uh, so that you can connect it up to various hardware instruments using using an interface so you can keep everything synchronized and better yet it will even act as its own Wi-Fi access point uh, when you're playing in a venue that either doesn't have Wi-Fi or whose Wi-Fi is so overloaded by yuppies using their phones that you can't actually get anything reliable out of it. So <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very, very handy little device. And uh, their tech support is excellent. And, and two of them will connect together. So you know, yes. two different people can be, uh, have all their instruments uh, synced. Yeah, Jim and I have often used this for live shows actually i like the uh, fact that it has a clock because that's going to be a rock solid clock yeah yeah i mean the whole thing i think i, I, I mike i think there's a raspberry pi in there somewhere yeah it wouldn't uh, surprise me some microcontroller yeah i mean the, uh, the 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 guy who engineered it is is really really helpful and really really friendly i've had a lot of correspondence with him about a a, a particular issue that uh it does tend to throw out uh, a certain amount of high frequency hash, I think. But the only time I ever had trouble with it was when I was driving an OP1 with it directly, and the OP1 has noise problems anyway <laughs> that I had to deal with uh, in, in, in another way. So it, it, it's, it, it's a really swell little device. Uh, you just incorporate that into your music, right? Yep, exactly. Exactly. Actually, what I did was go out and buy a, a device that Pile makes that is essentially a hum eliminator, and it's spectacular. <laughs> oh, sweet. All right, I have a question for you. Sure. You've, you've just returned from the Apple Store with a brand new iPad. You've sat down and you've set it up, and you're about to download your first audio application and the Boogaloo boys break in and you have 30 seconds to download one music application before they haul you off to the right wing detention camp. What app is that going to be? That's a really good question. Uh, I think in terms of learning, you know, I like Animog. I like Animog because it's very playable. It retains a, a, a keyboard interface, so you're not dealing with that confusion. It has the ability to preset scales and all of that stuff. And because there are some excellent tutorials out there on sound design with it, uh, even though the approach to sound design on it is really not standard. <laughs> uh, there, there are still excellent tutorials for it. If I wanted something that looked more like a hardware synth, 
Uh, I might go with Xeon or or one of the Moog ones, although they tend to be the the the, the fifteen, for example. They 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 tend to be resource hogs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily do that, but Xeon would be a good compromise there. Uh, uh, Tom Tom, I agree with you. I I think the begin the starter one should be Animoog. Is it's really versatile and it sounds fantastic. Yeah, and and believe it or not, Jim, I think I first found out about it from you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I I think I walked up to you after one of Trevor's talks, actually, <laughs> and said, "What the hell was that?" <laughs> and you were kind enough to answer me. Well, if anything's uh, a a good sign of the validity of that instrument is the fact that it's a big part of every time Suzanne Chani plays now. Oh, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I'm, I'm hearing Animog patches in a lot of stuff just on internet radio. Oh, interesting. Uh, at this point. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting instrument. And if you look in the linked tutorials from the chat, uh, there is a set of three sound design tutorials for Animog in there that are just really, really great. Uh, very, very well done. Tom? Yes. Another thing to mention in Elm is that uh, it has a recorder and um, a file player, which I use both. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can, I, I've seen people even do sort of looping demos with it. Uh, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll confess something to you guys. I mean, between this week and next week, the one thing you're not going to see me do is demonstrate a looper of any kind because I hate them all. Uh, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I don't have the motor coordination to use any of them. So it, it tends to be a real blind spot for me. I understand Enso is very good. Uh, but as, as Carl's pointing out. And loopy. You, I don't have MIDI sync, huh? Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> as, as as Joe points out, there is Loopy. Uh, I I have an intellectual objection to Loopy, which is that its designer is so obsessed with his own preciousness that he refuses to label the goddamn loops. <laughs> I I just go in with with all empty loops, and then I don't have time to sit there and label. That's what magic mount markers are for, right? For, right? Right on the screen. Yeah, China <laughs> marker. <laughs> Get a China marker. That, that's my answer. Uh, yeah, but you can do, I mean, honestly, if, if I were, you know, one of the advantages of using a digital audio interface to the iPad is that you can obviously record digital directly without any sort of intervening analog stuff to introduce hum or noise or what have you. But... Honestly, at this point in time, if I wanted to track something and then mix it, I would do the tracking in OM just by using the per channel recorders uh, and then put the whole thing together in something like Aurea Pro, uh, which is a really, really nice uh, mixing and mastering program for the iPad. Let's see if I can grab it here. Come hither, O oh Aurea Pro. Let us see you. There you are. Yeah, I think I was just ma mastering something that Rob Snyder and I did in this. That's all that was. But the nice thing about Aurea is that you can use all the uh, all the FabFilter plugins with it, and they're spectacular. The compressor and the EQ, particularly. But yeah, you can you can do some pretty sophisticated stuff in in, in this. I wouldn't attempt to demonstrate it on the spot, but it's 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 certainly there to be done. Ah, four inserts. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. No, it's nice. It's nice. Well, you've got you've got four you've got four inserts there, and then you've got a similar number of you've got four inserts per channel. 
Right, that's what I was admiring. Yeah. As well as on the master, and you've got four cents. Wow, all stereo, yeah. Yep. Yep. No, it's it's nice. Uh, let's look at the. Uh, I mean, the compressor is great. Is the uh, is the Fab filter uh, pricing on the I iOS side similar similarly a lot cheaper than like you know an, like an OS X app is typically like five to ten times the price of what it would be on an iPad? Is that true for the Fab filter stuff too? Because I know their stuff's like three hundred bucks for a, a plugin for the. OS I can X. answer that with one word repeated four times. Ha 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 ha. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the plugins are not as pricey as they are for their professional studio line and stuff, but they're not cheap. It, it's not five bucks, <laughs> I assure you, <laughs> but they're actually, they, they are, they are well worth it in terms of, of, of time saved. They're just really, really nice. So yeah, I mean, honestly, if I were just if I were just tracking and 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 mixing something simple, I would I would record all of the basic tracks and 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 um and then shove them into this thing or or even put them in uh, put them in live from um using the file player. There's lots of ways you could go about it. But that's a topic for another day. <laughs> all right. I think we're getting to the end of our time, are we not? Yeah, it's a five after 10 here on the East Coast, which I think we all, most of us are anywhere. I think I heard birds in the background of somebody. That kind of freaked me out a little bit. Yeah, it wasn't anyway, me. it wasn't me. <laughs> no, more like foresty birds. Um, anyway, um, any more questions? If uh, no more questions, then I guess, oh, I see, I see Laura got uh, Animog there. Yep. Oh, you, you never you never used that before. Oh, you're gonna love it. Oh yes, yeah. I used it. Oh, you did. Okay, yeah, First it's a great thing. thing. I got. All right. <laughs> yeah, awesome. take take but take. I kind, of, I kind of forgot about my iPad because I got so frustrated with uh, the MIDI issue, but now I'm looking at it again. Awesome. Well, that's good. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Uh, so listen, guys, if you want to either shoot me by email or in the in the discussion section of the the event thing, any any questions or particular apps you'd like to look at for next week, because I really have not much in mind there. Uh, we might take a look at some Animog sound design since everybody seems to have at least a passing interest in that. But beyond that, I got I got nothing in particular that I want to do. So it, it can go wherever you guys want to. I was going to concentrate on apps, but but let me know what you'd like.